On Wednesday afternoons in the third grade, we had music class. We would sit in four long straight lines, staring up, staring up at our teacher at the piano, waiting to learn what song she had for us that day. One afternoon, she decided to teach us a song about smiles. So she whispered, did you know that smiles are contagious? Now I remember staring out of the window, watching the rain fall, thinking, what on earth does that mean? And I guess I figured it out eventually. But until I did, it's a very incredible concept once you understand it. Which brings me to today's topic. What is a chain reaction? It's basically when something small leads to something bigger. These can be both negative, like a reaction of nuclear fission leading to a nuclear explosion, or positive, like a chain reaction of smiles leading to a wildfire of happiness. So for example, let's try an experiment. Can everyone pair up with the person next to you? Now, the person on the left, smile. OK. By show of hands, how many of the people on the right smiled back? Good. Now, imagine you're walking down the street. Uh, can I have a name from the audience, please? So someone in the th front. OK. So you're walking down the street, and you see Sarah. Now, you don't know Sarah very well, but you smile at her anyway. Most of the time, Sarah will smile back. Someone crossing the street will see Sarah smiling. They'll smile too. So with that one smile, you brighten Sarah's day, the other person's day, and then many other people's days who saw them smiling. And you have a chain already. Now imagine you're walking down that exact same street, and a butterfly sits on your arm. So you'll either scream and cry, you'll try to look at the colors, you'll try to take a picture. Here's a picture my dad took when it happened. Now, any of these ways, you lose a couple of seconds. And in those lost seconds, the traffic light turns green, and you have to wait across the street. Then you see a friend walking towards you. Maybe it's Sarah. Now, you stop, you chat, you grab a meal together. Now you've lost a few hours, and you have to spend a Saturday making up for lost time. The butterfly effect is when a small change in initial conditions leads to a completely different outcome. It's associated with the work of a scientist called Edward Lorenz, who gave a metaphorical explanation that the formation of a tornado could be due to a butterfly flapping its wings a few weeks earlier. Now, isn't it amazing how something small, or even your expression, can change someone's day or even their life? So another memorable incident that happened was something else someone said several years after music class that Wednesday. It was something my dad said to me. So every, as far as I can remember, I've had trouble making decisions. Not big decisions, but little ones like what to wear, what to order at a restaurant, what to talk about in this TED talk. So this one day I had a set of new notebooks, and I couldn't choose which one to use first. So I go up to my dad and I ask him. And because of the lightness of the situation, he can't believe I'm asking a question that insignificant, which wasn't so to me an avid overthinker. So I pest out him some more. I try to get an answer. He looks at me and he says, Shania, use the best one first. Now I'm completely baffled by this statement. My mind starts playing the thousands of times people have told me to save the best for last, something I'm sure people have told you too. But he said, this way, you never have to compromise. So let me explain this better. If you have four things to choose from, here, notebooks. Today, you choose the favorite of the four that you have. So you're not compromising, you're using the best one. Tomorrow, you choose your favorite of the remaining three. Again, you don't compromise. And as you keep going, you're always using your favorite of the books you have. So an idea that's so simple is just not widely spread enough. When I had to make decisions, I'd feel really flustered. I'd always get nervous, I'd get anxious. And now when I think of this, it calms me down, which is why with choosing that one notebook, I can stand here, clear-headed, confident, addressing you all today. This confidence also helped me express the musical part of myself. Since I was two, I've loved dancing, I've loved music. It's always spoken to me differently. So a couple of years later, my dad decides to get me a guitar. He said, why don't you try making music? So I started, we called in a teacher, we started learning basic chords. And when we moved to songs, he asked me to sing. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I've always been a Grammy award-winning shower singer, but I never believed I had a great singing voice. Then, when I started practicing, so my first reaction was, no, I can't sing. So in practice, then I started getting used to matching my pitch to the chords I was playing. I st my voice, the confidence in my voice started building up slowly. And next thing I know, my friends convinced me to audition for the senior school choir. I was in the eighth grade at the time, so the youngest batch in senior school. I was standing small, intimidated by the high ceilings and magnificent archways of the building. I walk into the hall and sing Amazing Grace. It was just me, the choir conductor, and the music captain, so it wasn't as terrifying as I had made it out to be in my mind. And I got into the choir, and I learned how to sing better. My confidence in my voice started building up. So the next year, my mom convinces me to audition for an event my school hosts every year called Encore. Now, I changed my mind every 30 seconds. I said, no, I'm not going to audition. Okay, yes, maybe I will. I get to the audition now, and I'm standing there holding a mic in my hand, shaking. I see six teachers standing with score sheets in front of me waiting to take this audition. I see a million students behind them just staring at me. My vision goes blurry, and I have blacked that audition out of my mind. But I got in, and then came the long-awaited day, December 10th, encore. The audience was huge. It had parents, students, teachers, my parents standing proud in the front with their cameras ready. Now, here's a picture when I first started singing. I look like I'm going to cry. And here's one about halfway into the song. I'm feeling the music. I'm enjoying myself. And this exact moment right here is when I found my love and passion for singing. My point in telling you this story is to turn every single one of your I can'ts into I'll tries or I wills. And maybe you'll find something that gives you meaning, something that you're so passionate about. So now that I've spoken to you about the cultural part of myself, I want to talk to you about science. The picture you see here is a reflex arc. It's one of the most common chain reactions in biology. It starts with a stimulus, which could be, say, your hand touching a hot flame. We have a signal sent down your sensory neuron. It goes to your central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord. And then a signal is sent down your motor neuron, which would lead to a response, which would be your hand pulling away from the flame. So in the seventh grade, we had a science exam. Now, it wasn't until 11 p.m. that night that 12-year-old me realized I don't really know anything my textbook says. So enter my mother to the rescue with a big box of Hershey's Kisses so that I don't fall asleep, equipped with paper and colored pens to take notes. And I don't know whether it was the sugar high that night while learning or the way I was taught, but my love for all things science started that very evening. So let's make that the stimulus. A couple of years later, I represented school at a science camp at the National University of Singapore. Over there, I learned that science isn't divided into physics and chemistry and biology as we study it, but it's actually an interdisciplinary part of our everyday life. And I'm going to make that the central nervous system. Forward time to now, I'm studying physics and chemistry in school, and I hope to be an engineer in the future. So that is the response. Now that I've spoken to you about how chain reactions have taken place in my life, I want to talk to you about how you can get sucked into one. What animal do you see in this picture? This one? What about this? First grade stuff, right? OK. Now everyone, please close your eyes and put yourself in this situation. You're standing in line to go on a safari at Disney's Animal Kingdom. Everywhere you look, you see facts and animations about zebras all around you. You take a step forward, and you see a fun fact that reads, did you know that zebras are actually black with white stripes? So everywhere, it's just zebra, zebra, zebra. Now you can't wait to see these zebras yourself. OK, now you're in that safari cart, you're ready to explore the wildlife. The, the sky has the iconic Lion King sunset painted on. There's about 15 other people with you. And the tour guide tells you to look left to see a tall, majestic animal. Now, you see a giraffe. You think giraffe. You know that there is, in fact, a giraffe standing in front of you. 
but you scream, hey, look, it's a zebra. Okay, no one in their right mind would do that, right? Wrong. I did that. I was in the exact situation I just placed you all in, and I screamed, hey, look, it's a zebra. Now, I didn't tell you this story to embarrass myself, obviously, no. I've told you this story to show you the impact that a chain reaction can have. The build-ups and repetitions of the zebra facts all around me made me, at 13 years old, I might add, mistake a giraffe for a zebra. The build-ups that these chain reactions hold have the ability to brainwash you. They can train your mind to think in a certain way. Remember in the beginning of this talk when I spoke about chain reactions being both negative and positive? The negative here could be Hitler's speeches, stirring hatred, giving rise to World War I. And the positive could be Martin Luther King, talking about equality in his I Have a Dream speech, inspiring the entire world, the entire generation of people to fight against inequality. So the power of words is also something else I learned from this very incident. When I sat in that safari cart and blurted out this sentence, I look around me. There's five-year-olds looking up at me thinking, what in the world? There's my mom sort of curling back into her seat thinking to herself, no, my 13-year-old daughter did not just say that. There's other parents staring at me. And I just sat there saying, wow, something I said affected so many people. Now, if you have an idea, if you have something to share, if you have something to say, you have to say it or you'll never know how the world will react to it. Now, I know this wasn't a positive impact, but just being a little more introspective and a little less on the edge to blur things out, you can really make a difference. So grab a hold of this power of communication, of action, of speech, and do things you didn't think you were capable of doing. Make those changes. An idea that you're not sharing is an idea with no power. A chain reaction can start with a smile, it can start with a notebook, it can start with a butterfly, a guitar strum, a Hershey's kiss, or a zebra. Or one could start right here, right now, with you. Thank you.